Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Jensen Karp, co-curator and co-owner with Katie Cromwell of Gallery 1988, located at the famous corner of Melrose and La Brea in Hollywood, California. They've just published a second volume of Crazy for Cult Movie Art, a collection of artwork influenced by modern film favorites. Stick around, but please, if you're an artist, know your trademark law before jumping on this trend too hard. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of squirrely art critics who don't know Renoir from Aaron Rents in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Are you one of those people who admits, I don't know art, but I know what I like? Have I got an art gallery for you? Katie Cromwell and Jensen Karp opened Gallery 1988 as a place the f common filmgoer could enter and not feel intimidated. The work they exhibit and sell puts a spotlight on emerging artists who have a po pop culture bent. Located at the world-famous Hollywood, California corner of Melrose and La Brea, Cromwell and Karp have developed a reputation over the past decade for showcasing art that appeals to a wide palette of tastes, from film goers to filmmakers and more. And along the way, the proprietors of Gallery 1988 mined a particular vein of interest in cult movie art. And because not everyone can visit their location in person, they have produced two coffee table collections featuring the best of this work. Joining me today to discuss the latest volume of Crazy for Cult Movie Art 2 is Jensen Karp. Jensen, welcome to Mr. Media. Oh, thanks for having me on. Glad to have you here. Um, this is such a cool collection that you guys have put together um, uh, for the second time. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit how you found yourself uh, on this particular path. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ten years ago, I came out of the music industry and uh, I was uh, friends. I went to USC, University of Southern California out here, and I was friends with with Katie, and she was working in an art gallery, uh, sort of on the same block that we're on now, actually, on Melrose. And we used to make jokes, because I'd come out of the music industry and made a good amount of money in the early 2000s there, and the owner would just treat me like crap. He had no idea that I'd make the money, or he was just a mean guy, sort of, and he wouldn't let us, uh, wouldn't even really speak to the 20 to 30 year old demographic, sort of ignoring the idea that we, we have disposable money. We're spending $300 on Air Jordans and $500 on handbags. Uh, and so we would make jokes all the time, and that joke turned into a business idea, which was what if we made a gallery that focused directly on this 20 to 35 year old demographic and worked with these emerging artists that aren't necessarily uh, expensive enough or pompous enough to be in these spaces. Uh, and, and that was where the idea came from. And then meeting these artists, we would meet them in like parking lots and downtown lofts where there was like a one night event. These things that weren't traditional at all. And we knew that there was sort of a gap between those two things, this, this traditional art gallery world and these young artists just coming up. And we learned quickly that these artists and these buyers in this age group, they may have been influenced by Picasso and Degas in the past, but now they're influenced by Nintendo or the Coen brothers. It's just a different media generation. 
Uh, and rather than tell them not to do it, which what most galleries did, we actually uh, we sort of celebrated the idea that they would put that kind of pop culture elements into their work. And it was only a matter of time, me being sort of a film buff, uh, I just wanted a cult movie film, you know, sort of a show that's inspired by those cult movies so badly. Uh, and then three years later, now we're on our seventh annual year of Crazy for Cult. That's become our, our most recognizable show. Hmm. And so when you decided to open uh, the gallery, were you thinking this was going to be a business that would uh, kind of completely suck you guys in? Or was this like a side thing and you were going to do something oh, no. else? We had decided it was going to be our business. If I mean, we would be lying if we thought we'd be here 10 years later. I right. mean, Melrose, the street Melrose itself is turnover rate, I think, is an average of uh, 14 months. Um, so I think we had high hopes, but neither of our hopes were 10 years later. To you know, we have more than two books out. We have, I think, at this point, probably four or five books that we've co-published with Titan. Uh, not to mention, we've worked hand in hand with almost every studio in Hollywood uh, in a marketing capacity. Uh, those were all pipe dreams. Yeah, it's amazing because you know I was thinking back many years ago there was a there was a trend for these uh, shops that opened up that were selling animation cells, for example. That was very yeah. hot, very pop culture kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, but you know after a few years you know I've got two of them and uh, you know they're probably worth next to nothing but uh, you know yeah. it, was, it was fun to collect for a while. It's interesting. I mean that yeah, a decade later you guys are yeah. still at this and it's still popular. People are still creating new art, obviously for you to display. Yeah, I mean and, and now it would be hard to find a major city that hasn't copied us. I mean we were the first pop culture art gallery uh, in the world uh, and and now like I said it would be hard pressed to not find one in every in every major city and you know a lot of people would think we become sort of aggravated at that but in real life it it it's a no brainer. I, I I would I always thought to myself like if there was a big Lebowski painting that I could buy I wouldn't let it sit for more than 2 minutes. Uh, and and if that was my feeling we've sort of built the gallery on that concept if we would put it in our house then we should we should sell it. And I I said in the introduction that uh you know if you're per, try, kind of person who you know you're not like a big art person but you kind of know what you like this yeah. this is not a space that you would feel intimidated walking into. No, I had no history uh in art at all. I had I didn't I came and draw a circle. Uh Katie Katie was an art history major at USC and, and graduate from that program, and uh, I depended on her 100% when it came to that stuff. I just knew what it is I wanted to see, uh, and then she was in charge of telling me if this person was talented or not. And in most cases, we lined up almost 100%. So, well, and uh, that's something I wanted to ask you: where do your where do your tastes and Katie's kind of merge, and then where also do they kind of di diverge? Well, I think we live in a world, I mean, we don't lie to ourselves. We know we live in sort of this weird pop culture bubble for the gallery, and, and we decided to make it that bubble, and we created that bubble in our minds. Uh, so um, we have tastes that are for the gallery. You know, there's certain things we love, and like, oh, my God, this would be perfect for the gallery. But then you go to my house, and I only have like six pieces of art in my house up at all, and, and I think five of them are from 1988. Um, so our personal tastes definitely differ. She's a female. I'm a male. Uh, so her things are a little more dainty than mine. Um, but, you know, I, I think when it comes to the gallery, we look for people who take these pop culture uh, icons, characters, storylines. And, and our goal is to find someone who, who puts their own spin on it. And that's the thing that we sort of meet in the middle on so strongly is, is we don't want to see just someone take Bill Murray's face and screen print it onto a white piece of paper. Um, anyone can do that. We want to see someone take their personal style um, and, and put it into this pop culture world. That's why we like so many artists that all year long show at galleries. You know, they might not show pop culture themed stuff all the time. They're not fan artists. It's just this is what they do for a profession and we're tapping into one uh, one source of inspiration for them. Well, and, and you know, I should probably point out, and correct me if I get this wrong, but uh, for example, in, in my own home, I have a gigantic, it's it's bigger than a one sheet. It's like a I don't know. It's a huge Sid and Nancy yeah, like, movie poster. Like, like a 36 by 48. They're almost like right. international ones, right? Yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. It's this enormous Sid and Nancy movie poster. In another room, I have a, a Nosferatu uh, from the, the kind of – I think it was the remake uh, back yeah. in the 80s. What you're, what you're offering, what you're showing and what you're selling, these are not movie posters. I want to make that clear yeah. to people. These are, th these are original works of art that are inspired, right, by film. In, in many yeah, cases. I mean, we've worked, we've worked with studios before to make actual movie posters. They'll hire us to come in and do them, um, but that's not our source of business. Our source of business is really uh, creating original pieces of artwork or limited edition prints that um, have the inspiration from those films, but are in no way, shape, or form uh, forced. You don't, in most cases, you don't even have to see the movie to understand the art that we show. Uh, if you look through the book, there will be films you've never seen. We have tons of people who've never seen Repo Man, which should be fixed 
very quickly. Hard but if you, see the, yeah, yeah, if you see the artwork from Repo Man, it, it will speak to you even if you haven't seen the film. It's just good art, and that's, that's sort of the goal, is, is always to find the artists that are going to bring the best spin to these films. And I wanted to, I, I meant to earlier, I mentioned some of the films that have inspired art in this second edition of uh, Crazy for Cult. Uh, the Shining, Alien, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Little Shop of Horrors, Edward Scissorhands, Darnie Dar- Donnie Darko, The Big Lebowski, yeah. which you mentioned, and of course, uh, Shaun of the Dead. And those are yeah. just a fraction of, of what's in there. What you know, what really works for this concept? I mean, is it that uh, someone is inspired by a scene, by the overall film, uh, a character in it? What, you know, what, what, is, there, is, there a, is there a template for what works and what doesn't? Not a template. I mean, I think, I think people want to remember their scenes or favorite characters. So uh, we normally push people to do the movies they're passionate about. You know, I, I, if you've never seen the movie, I, I think you're going to make a bad piece. I mean, I, for example, Kirsten Essenpriest, who has pieces in the book, uh, she's an artist who uses this sort of gouache, flash style, very shiny paintings, all originals, all hand done. Um, she only does movies that she's super passionate about. So, for example, recently she did a piece based on the movie Dragnet, uh, that's crazy. I mean, that's a Tom Hanks forgettable comedy vehicle, yeah. 80s. Um, but she's so passionate about it, and she, she created such a time capsule for that film that if you love that movie, it is going to speak to you, and you're going you're gonna to fight. I mean, if it was an auction, you would have no limit on it. Um, and we did a similar thing for Wet Hot American Summer, which is this cult film made by David Wayne and the guys from the state. And we did a whole celebration for its anniversary. And at first, Katie and I, it's our favorite movie, really. And Katie and I were both sort of like, is anyone going to come? You know, is anyone going to show up? And we found 50 artists who were just as passionate about the movie as we did, as we were. And uh, it was packed. And, and we had the stars of the movie. Paul Rudd came by. Chris Maloney bought a piece, you know, David Wayne was there opening night, Ken Marino was there, Joe Latruglio, and we really tapped into this audience that was passionate about this very small cult movie. And I think we feel the same way about the art, which is I don't need to see the most blown up part from the movie. I don't need to see the part everyone remembers. I need to see the part that people are passionate about, the things that people want to hang in their homes. Um, and that's really the main template, which is just do something you feel passionate about, not something that's from every commercial about the movie. Mm. If you've actually had someone do a, a, a piece based on the film Dragnet, we got to make sure people understand. You're talking about the yeah. movie Dragnet, not the Jack Webb series. Correct. This is yeah, Tom Hanks. Tom, oh my Tom God. Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd. Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd. A movie where they it's it's almost like what they did for Twenty One Jump Street recently with Jonah Hill, which is right. make sort of a farce movie based on a kind of serious TV show. And it's by the way, it's a great movie. So you haven't had anyone do another Dan Aykroyd movie, uh, Doctor Detroit, I trust. No, but we have had nothing but trouble. Uh, <laughs> more than once. So uh, in, in the Dr. Detroit, nothing but trouble land, it's a real 50-50 uh, what's worse. Now, I would have to think that there's a certain group of movies, uh, like from the 80s, for example, that would, would hold up very well to this type of treatment. Uh, I, well, actually, 70s, 80s. I'm thinking, you know, uh, Animal House and Caddyshack and uh, sure. Stripes and uh, yeah. uh, American Pie, things like that. Uh, do they ever get tackled or is that not what you're looking um, at? They don't get tackled that much. I mean, that's where my that's where my instincts lie. So, like, if I were to make paintings, I would they would be based on the burbs. So like, right. I mean, I always go towards comedy that's like very uh, relaxed and very cultish in the time that it was made. But most people go towards the stronger films, more towards Edward Scissorhands, more towards um, you know, the, the, we've had a lot of Fargo pieces. I mean, a lot of things that um, are known as cult movies, um, the Caddyshacks and stuff like that. Uh, our cult because, I mean, and we can get into the definition of cult if you like, but we see it as many different things. One of them being uh, a movie that has created a new audience over time. So even something like Jaws is a cult movie, even though it was the biggest summer blockbuster ever. But because a new generation has found Jaws and, and given it a new definition, uh, we do consider it a cult film here. So um, it depends on what people see as cult and, and what each artist sees it as, but most still go towards freaks and most still go go towards the, the, the um, traditional definition of a cult movie. Hmm. Um, so you and you personally, your tastes run more to comedy. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, yeah. My 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 whole. I mean, I I've I've been writing for Funny or Die and Jash, and that's where my I was a, a writing major at USC. So all of my taste. I was a UCB grad, so uh, most of my tastes go towards comedy. And so if if I'm a starving artist in LA. Uh, looking to make a, and I have some talent. I mean, I'm not just saying, you know, but and if I have some talent, should I be thinking maybe this is a way to, you know, sell a piece and break out a little bit? Has this worked for Absolutely. artists? 
Yeah, we uh, absolutely. I mean, we have uh, a list of artists who've started in these group shows, and be, I have I have a good example of someone who is I went I was a camp counselor growing up. I was a, a teenager, and he, I was a camp counselor. And one of the guys that I came up with uh, at counseling you know, as a counselor emailed me and was like, "Hey, I have a cousin who wants to get into art. He's never shown in a gallery." Uh, and I was like, "Listen, we do this show every year called Crazy for Cold. It's got a hundred artists in it. You know, eighty of them are normally people we show all year long." We had about 20. I had about 20 a year new people send me his stuff, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. I was like, man, your cousin's great. Let's put him in Crazy for Cold. Uh, and so he did the first year, sold his piece, did the second year, sold his piece. He's too busy now to show with us. Uh, he shows in other galleries around, around the world. Uh, and it, it proved to us, I mean, and we've had interns also who we've put in Crazy for Cold because we like their work, and then now they show in five, six different galleries around the world. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's one of the only art shows. Uh, at all that has its own book deal. Uh, it's the only art show that was ever hosted by Kevin Smith. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a very high profile show. So absolutely. I and mean, we take submissions all year long and uh, the best submissions are one that don't even involve movies. You know, we, we like seeing submissions of painters that are doing great stuff on their own or digital artists are doing great stuff on their own and then uh, want to do something in movies for us. So we always are looking. Yeah. Well, and so tell, tell me a little bit. Are, are, is most of the art is it now I'm, I can see from what's behind you that those are not paintings. So tell yeah. me, tell me, you know, what you're looking for. Is it paintings? Is it sketches? Is it, you know, hand drawn illustrations? Uh, We're looking for anything. I mean, we, we show across the board. Every show has these group shows have painting. You'll see in the book paintings, prints, sculptures, one of a kind plush. I mean, everything is in that book and, and we don't hold ourselves back. I mean, we've had photos in those shows before. Um, so we're never looking for something that really just fits a certain mold. I mean, behind me is Prince from an artist named Alex Bardi, who's one of our most popular. Um, but his, his real talent has always been in painting and now he's sort of getting more into digital work, um, and selling prints for a more affordable price point. But, you know, we, 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 we're a gallery who has no real rules or guidelines and we were opened on the idea of making fun of galleries that do. Um, so we feel the same way about mediums. And so, uh, you know, you've uh, you've found an artist. You've decided you're going to show them in in the cult sh show or some some other show, yeah. for that matter. Uh, sure. Are you are you selling prints, lithographs, uh, postcards? What yeah. uh, we do, we um, our most common theme right now because it's very hot. Like you said, animation sells has a time. Right now, the time is with screen prints. A couple of years ago, it was with vinyl toys. There's just sort of in this run. So screen prints right now are really the thing that seems to be selling the most. Uh, but we also do really well with G clay prints. I think while I was on this interview, we sold out of a new set. Uh, so, you know, we do G clay prints, screen prints, paintings, um, we sell everything at the show. So if, if we like it, that's the main, uh, that's the real only thing that you need to make happen. And when you started the gallery, you and Katie, um, how did you convince people to let you show their work when you had something in mind, but it, it had not really been seen before? I mean, it wasn't easy at first. I mean, I think some people will still, were still pushing towards doing traditional stuff. Um, but it was really, I mean, we found the right group. You know, we got, we got, we jumped on a lot of really fast trains. I mean, there's one example of a, a guy we had a show, we had a video game inspired show, very Nintendo. Hmm. And uh, we had found a guy online named Greg Simpkins, who was a graffiti artist who went under the name Crayola. And uh, we had emailed him and he had a day job at a video game company. And we had interviewed him about doing the show. And he was like, absolutely, I love video games. And he turned something in. And uh, that was nine years ago, almost 10 years ago. Uh, and he's went on, he averages, I think, about $22,000 a painting now. Wow. Uh, and he shows other places. He's, he's sort of moved on to the blue chip land. Uh, but, you know, we, you would think he wouldn't be someone. You know, if you were to go in the gallery and see him doing these still lifes of kind of uh, surreal frogs and stuff that he's doing now, he's one of the most incredible painters I've ever seen in person. Um, you wouldn't think necessarily that he'd be willing to do that. But in the first Crazy for Cold book, you can see he did an Edward Scissorhands piece that's incredible, blows you away. Um, and, and it's not hard to find that inspiration as long as they're sort of in our age group or lower. Um, what, what is the range in terms of if I came into the gallery uh, later today, for example, and uh, by the way, I'm not going to. It's a little too far to come right now for me. But uh, <laughs> if, you walk, if you walk through the computer screen, that would be uh, an incredible move. Your ratings would yeah. fly. Yeah. Yeah. Fly. Uh, what, I mean, what's the range of cost for an original piece in the gallery? Uh, for originals, I think we, we go from about 100 to $150 is our low. And then our high is a couple thousand dollars. Um, so that's for original work. For prints that are limited or open edition, I mean, we average, you know, we, we range from about 10 
to two hundred dollars, and we probably average about fifty, forty. And are you seeing uh, cult uh, prints or paintings, uh, whatever? Are you seeing them appreciate, or is it the kind of thing that hey, you like it, you're gonna you're gonna like it forever? Or no, is, is they it? all they all they've been great investments for everybody. I mean, you can just go on eBay right now and type in any of the artists that we show in these shows, and you'll, it'll disgust you almost. Uh, you know, we, we, we had a guy, Ali Moss, uh, who's an artist, a, a digital artist, a, gr a graphic artist, designer. Uh, and he started with us, I don't know, probably seven years ago, six years ago now. And when we first worked with him, he didn't even know necessarily how these things get printed, how the screen prints get printed. Uh, and now, seven years later, I mean, you could go on eBay right now and see an average of probably like $1,500. Some of his prints are going for, you know, $4,000. And those are screen prints. I mean, it's not even, you know, there's 100 of them to 500 of them in some cases. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, we've been a good investment for uh, an incredible amount of artists. So when you uh, when you open, uh, I assume that you do when you open the Hollywood Reporter uh, any given week, uh, they they do a lot of profiles of uh, studio executives and things, and they show you around. They show photos from their offices. Do you often op open up something like that, or or Los Angeles Magazine, yeah. what have you, and and Absolutely. see? Yeah, yeah. Hollywood Reporter recent, or is it Variety? One of the two, Variety or Ho I think it's Hollywood Reporter. Recently did a showrunner. Uh, feature where they show you their offices. Hollywood were, Reporter, I think I saw that. Hollywood Reporter, right. So there was four showrunners and we had art in three of them in wow. the photo. And then in the fourth, they buy from us but there was no image in the photo. Uh, so that happens frequently now, especially, you know, recently Aaron Paul posted a picture of himself in his house and behind him I saw one of our pieces and it's happening more and more frequently and I went to a comedy show the other night that was in some, it's a, the gimmick of the comedy show is it's in someone's living room uh, and so we went and it was Mobbed and busy, and, and the, the whole space was filled with our gallery, with our gallery's work. Um, so it's becoming more and more frequent. And uh, you know, when we look down at our, our website and see, you know, oh, this was sold to Seth Meyers in New York. It's like that's a great feeling for us to to be selling to people who are actually inspiring artwork. Uh, you mentioned Aaron Paul, and I wanted to ask you about. There's a shirt on yeah. your site for sale. Uh, it's uh, the Jesse Pinkman shirt, uh, Captain Cook. Uh, yeah. Tell me about that, because we've really mostly just talked about film, but that obviously is yeah. a television. Yeah. Most of our, hist our, our large history is in television, actually. So uh, we first started working with the Disney company uh, about nine years ago as consultants. Uh, and they, they kept us on for about two years. And they were extremely ahead of their time. Katie and I were mostly doing online poker at the gallery. And they, <laughs> they noticed that we're going to be busy soon. Uh, and so they told us to bring the mentality that we have for the gallery into their company. Um, and we did that. And we worked with them for two years. And they paid us. And it was incredible. Uh, they were a great company to work for. Uh, and then from there, it turned into other jobs. Uh, I, I consulted at Mattel. We brought in He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and Hot Wheels here to the gallery and worked in a capacity with these companies. Um, and that, that really started our careers. You know, I, I ended up getting an agent through that and, and sort of becoming a marketing uh, facility. Uh, and and to, that turned into what was our biggest job at the time, which was to work on the final season of Lost. So Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse contacted us and had us work on a marketing campaign that was completely our idea. And it was worldwide. Uh, we did things in Japan and we did things all over the globe uh, that turned into sort of being able to buy these posters, these limited edition posters at every stop that commemorated the show. Um, and that changed the business completely for what we're doing. And that's sort of one of the reasons that we have so many um, imitators now. Uh, so it was the most successful marketing campaign in uh, Disney history, which is amazing for us to say. Uh, and that turned into a bunch of other gigs, working for Paramount Pictures. We, we worked for the Oscars last year. They hired us. Uh, but the cool one for us, because we're big fans of the TV show Breaking Bad, was that uh, two seasons ago we were hired on um, to do a marketing campaign for them and to watch where that show has went, you know, has nothing to do, I mean, has very little to do with us, uh, but to watch where that show has went uh, has been one of the most satisfying career things for me, uh, just to be involved in that show. And so we've continued to work with them. You know, we did a print release this last season, and then we also made this shirt that you talked about that's on the website, this Captain Cook, Jesse Pinkman shirt. So we continue to have a relationship uh, with Sony, and we're about to announce an another big project with them. Uh, so uh, we work with these studios hand-in-hand, -hand, and that's what makes us different than our competition as well. And it's also something that Katie and I couldn't even have dreamt up. It's, we would have laughed at you. <laughs> I mentioned at the top of the show... Um... Uh, about uh, trademark law. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that enter into issues with you and your artists? No, I mean, mostly because we work with the, with the creators. I mean, we, we don't find ourselves in any position where we're not working. I mean, we get paid to do it in most cases. Uh, so it, it's, it's one of those things where we also aren't idiots. Um, so we know that if you paint Batman making out with Superman, you're, 
you probably legally have a leg to stand on, which is very nice to think of in our nation, uh, but it's also not a good thing to do. Uh, so, what right? Because I mean, if you if you if, it's one thing if you paint that, and maybe you sell a one of a kind painting, but if you start yeah. making prints and T-shirts yeah. of it. T-shirts, yeah. T-shirts is really the only thing that has real precedence. It's a Three Stooges law. I unfortunately have become a genius in the last 10 years towards copyright law. Mm-hmm. I wish I wasn't. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's very little precedence in this world, um, but I know that we wouldn't do things that we do without the blessing of the studio or the creator. I mean, at this point, we've worked with Judd Apatow, Stan Lee, Beastie Boys, uh, you know, Edgar Wright. I mean, we've done these things directly with these people involved, their charities and um, we've knock on desk, you know, had these great relationships that have always uh, helped us do these these things. And uh, you know, Adult Swim, and we've we've worked with so many great companies that understand how cool it is to empower these up and coming emerging artists and also uh, interact with these art buyers. Mm. Um, so we've been really lucky in that way. Well, I know the flip side of that. My daughter actually had a little shop on Etsy for a while where she was designing shoes and shirts that were. They had like a Harry Potter theme or uh, the, yeah. the Avengers theme or whatever and uh, ran afoul of them. And, and apparently other people did too, which is why I wondered, you know, what, what's, the, what's the limit for these artists in what they can do and, and sell through you in terms of… Yeah. I mean it has a lot to do with control. Like, you know, if, if these studios think that it's just wildly happening, that's what's going to get you your cease and desist letter. I mean we, we are in business with them. So uh, it's – oh, but these – also these companies are so big for the record. Uh, like a day before, I forget what show it was. Remember what show was we got a cease and desist the day before it happened? What was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was working with Sci Fi. I was working with the Sci Fi Network on a completely different thing. Uh, and so Sharknado aired on like a Friday, and I was watching it and was like, oh my God, this is going to be a cultural phenomenon. And I, I almost knew it immediately. And so I called them on a Friday, like a Friday at 5 p.m., and I was like, listen, if you give me the weekend, can I make two posters? And the guy was like, yeah. I talked to the CEO of Sci-Fi at home on a Saturday. And he was like, whatever you want, I will have no notes for you. I'm, I'm obsessed with what you guys do. Please take Sharknado and run with it. Um, little did he know what it would become. Uh, but that Monday, when we were about to release the Sharknado prints on a Tuesday, I got a cease and desist. Uh, so I was like, because they were now on radar to figure out what's going to happen with this cash cow. So I just wrote back, listen, call the CEO of Sci-Fi. And then she wrote back with this big like apology. Uh, she's like, I'm so happy you get to do it because I knew who you were. Uh, <laughs> so she, you know, those kind of things happen because the companies are so big. But once we sort of allow them to know that we're either on payroll or, you know, or or we've been involved in an in agreement with them, uh, they're fine with it. Cool. Uh, you want to talk a little bit uh, before we have to wrap up about some upcoming shows you have? Uh, uh... Absolutely. Well, we're most excited about Crazy for Colt. It's our seventh annual, and it's here to celebrate a second book. Uh, and we're doing it in New York City. It's our second time on the East Coast in New York. Uh, and it'll open December 13th. It's on the corner of Bowery and 3rd, and it's a, a huge undergoing for us. It's Last year, we, we gave ourselves ulcers putting it together, and this year we plan to do it again. Uh, and it's great. And it's, 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 again, what you see in the book, you're going to see again. It, it, all new artwork, all new prints, everything's available, and we're in New York, and it's December 13th we open. It runs till about Christmas Eve, right around there. Uh, you can get all the information at gallery1988.com. And then we do shows every month. I mean, there's two locations here in L.A., and we open new things all the time. We have an artist, N.C. Winters, who's the cover of the Crazy for Cult 2 book, uh, that incredible Jack, Jack shining Nicholson. piece. Right. Yep. Um, he has a, a solo show opening here uh, in about two weeks. Uh, and then on top of that, we have another show called uh, Rock, Paper, uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors, uh, with one digital artist, one sculptor, and one plush artist, all creating – this is a little hard to explain – uh, one piece each based on the same films. Oh. So you'll see one plush based on, uh, give me an example, anyone know one? Pulp Fiction. So you'll see one cult, uh, we'll see one piece that's a sculptor based on Pulp Fiction, one plush based on Pulp Fiction, and one digital print based on Pulp Fiction. And you'll see how each of them uh, represented it differently. And I, I'm really upset. I'm really excited about that show. That should be very cool. And one of the things I really liked about the book was, uh, and, and I respect that you guys do this, and I, I, I'm assuming you do this in your other books, but I hadn't seen this before. Is there's two pages at the end of the book where you've given it over to the names of the artists and each of their URL, so that yeah. if people like what they see in the book, they can actually follow up directly and learn more mm-hmm. about the artist. I assume most of them probably have uh, e-shops available, that kind of thing. Absolutely, and every and also it's a way to search on our website for them as well. You know, you, on our website, we're, we're in many of the cases we're an exclusive 
um, seller. We're an exclusive distributor for a lot of these people. Um, so you can go on that site and put in their names. And uh, yeah, it's an easy way to just learn more about art. And at the end of the day, Katie and I, uh, I think maybe, I don't want to say we've lost focus on it because we think about it all the time. But when we're doing shows every month, we don't talk about it as much as we used to. But the goal of this gallery has always been to sell to the first time buyer. Absolutely. I mean, I was a first time buyer. So there's, there's part of us that we know we're sort of like the drug dealer right now of art gallery, which is, you know, the first one is going to be cheap and it's going to draw you in. And then eventually you'll get into even more expensive art than we sell. And if we can lead people into that sort of world, uh, I think we're doing something great. Great. Uh, folks, listen, you can find Crazy for Cult, Movie Art 2, uh, and other books uh, collected by my guest, Jensen Karp, and his partner, Katie Cromwell. Uh, they're in great stores everywhere, or of course, you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. If you're watching on the page, right below the video, over there, you should see the uh, cover. You can click on it right now, get it from Amazon, and you can have it as early as tomorrow. So do that. Uh, and if you're in Los Angeles, you can visit Gallery 1988 in person at the corner of La Brea and Melrose. Uh, the website, you want to give that the URL again? Yeah, it's very easy. It's just gallery1988.com. Every one of the pieces we show end up on there. Everything that's available ends up on there. Uh, we do most of our sales out of the state. So uh, we, are, we are in bulk shippers. So we're ready for you. All right. And you're on uh, Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff? Yeah, we have galleries, plural, G-A-L-L-E-R-I-E-S, 1988 on Twitter. And then on Facebook, you can just like our page. And honestly, all of our announcements go first through that. So if, if any social media that you can get us through, uh, we announce all our releases and our shows there. And then uh, you can go to our website, gallery1988.com, and sign up for our mailer, uh, which sends you all of the announcements. Very cool. Well, it's a it's a it's a great fun book. It, it really can open your eyes to different aspects of even your favorite movies. You think you know everything about them until you see it interpreted uh, by a, an emerging artist in this case. And uh, Jensen Carp, thank you so much for joining us, in Mr. Media, today. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The TechCrunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash mrmedia. That's stitcher.com slash mrmedia. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party... Please consider calling 1 800 DIAL DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. 
you can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.